So our Friday quiz is obviously a geometric quiz. We just did dot product on our previous quiz, so we'll do cross product and all the distances, intersections. There's probably some, and writing just lines and planes in general. So that's going to be your next quiz. So it's all about cross products, lines, planes, distances, intersections. You don't know what two things I'm going to ask you to intersect or what two things I'm going to ask you about distance. So you have to be ready for combinations of different distances or intersections. And make sure if I ask you about intersections, you don't tell me the distance. Or if I ask you about distance, you don't tell me about intersections. So you're answering the question I ask you. Uh, and I was feeling lazy. I already wrote your quiz, and I took uh, things out of your homeworks. So I just went on web work and took problems. Great. So as long as you've done all your web work problems, you should be prepared. So we're going to go with uh, surfaces now. We're going to focus on quadratic surfaces because you've uh, spent a lot of time looking at quadratics already. So this will just be turning quadratics into a surface. <clears throat> so we're going to define a cylinder first. So this definition is going to be different than the one you're used to. You'll be able to apply this, uh, turn this definition into the cylinder you're thinking of pretty easily. But a cylinder is a surface generated by moving a line across a curve. And the specific type of moving that we're going to do is translating. So we're going to be specifically tra shifting specifically. So we're not going to be rotating this line. It's just going to stay in the same position. And it's going to move around. It's going to be, we're in three dimensions. So we don't just have a horizontal vertical shift. We also have a z coordinate shift as well. So we can be shifting in three dimensions now. Curve? Curve. So how in the world does the cylinder you're th you used to think about correspond to this definition? So I can draw the cylinder you're thinking about, well, the one that you're probably thinking about, something like this. So. How in the world does it, that cylinder relate to this definition? What type of a curve would we move our line? So we're going to move it across a circle. What circle? You can pick any of the any of the circles contained in your cylinder. So you could take the top, the bottom, or any one in between. So whatever of these circles you want to take in your cylinder. And then you're just taking a line and moving it across the circle. Of course, it's going to give us an infinitely tall cylinder. So our cylinders, uh, in this case, will be infinitely tall. So they will go on forever, upwards and downwards. <clears throat> you could be a little strange if you want to take a weird slice out of this. You could take a kind of diagonal slice and then you're still moving your line around. You would get the same cylinder. It would just have a slightly weird shift going on. But you get the same cylinder because your lines are infinitely long. So you wouldn't get a, a sort of skewed cylinder, or cylinder with diagonal top and bottom. So you can cut it in like weird shapes, like this, you, at least for my eyes, that looks diagonal to me. It does. but. Uh, what I would get would be some weird kind of diagonal cylinder, except for the fact that what I'm rotating is infinitely long. These lines are infinitely long. So there is no top and bottom to the cylinder. It goes on forever. Okay. So 
it would keep going up all over the place. It gets really ugly if you keep drawing all these arrows going on. So what we do is we just don't draw any of them, and we just say it goes on forever both directions. You just don't try to imagine it, right? You can. You don't try to imagine infinity, because we'll always fail at that. Yeah, you just say, ah, it goes on forever. Yeah. So that's our cylinder. So usually, it's easier to think about a curve on the xy plane in the usual way. So our easiest situation, our easiest type of curve is in the xy plane. So if you're graphing with the usual setup where your y is going to the right, your x is going out of the paper, and your z is up. Is that the usual axes when you're attempting to draw graph three dimensions? So a xy plane curve will exist. So here's the standard parabola right here. Y equals x squared. That's the happy parabola opening up on the y-axis. And if we put uh, line segments on this, if they're vertical, they will look like this. And you could think of the tops of them being connected and the bottoms of them being connected. So you get this. Um, a good way to think about it is a ribbon. This ribbon that's winding around, sitting on the top of a curve. Is it still considered a cylinder even if the two ends of the curve yes. never intersect? Yes. So it's, it's a generalized cylinder is what it is. It's a just a line moving across a curve. Sometimes, if the curve is a circle, it forms a cylinder you're thinking of. But if the curve's not a circle, it's not going to form a, the cylinder that we're thinking of. But we still call this shape, this surface is still called a cylinder. So here is the uh, equation of the curve. I just took the easiest nonlinear function I could think of to graph, just a regular parabola, y equals x squared. If I write out the full uh, set notation for all the points on this purple uh, cylinder, or purple surface, so there is, of course, three coordinates, x, y, z. They are subject to, you have to be on the y equals x squared curve. However, what? if any restriction should be on the z-coordinate. Do I need to worry about anything on the z-coordinate? No. Nope. As long as your x and y are related in this way, z can be anything. If z is 0, you get the original curve that I graphed out. If z is 0, and if z, let's say, is positive 1 or positive number, you would be above that curve. And if z is negative, you'd be below that curve. So you could think of these. The top one you could think of as z equals 1. The bottom one maybe uh, z equals negative 1. And then the original curve would be z equals 0. So that would be one way to think about what I drew out here. And again, these are infinitely tall, so I just picked three z coordinates, basically. <coughs> so that's the end of our description of this cylinder here. There's another way to write it. So if you think about the just the y equals x squared, what is the independent variable? If you knew one value, either x or y, what other value could you get? So if I knew a y value, could you definitely tell me what x? Plus or minus. Plus or minus. So you can almost tell me what value. But if you knew x, you could tell me y with no ambiguity. So if you knew x, you could tell me y. That's what this equation uh, describes. So I could rewrite 
our set notation. If I know x, then y is x squared. So if I know x, y is x squared. And then again, z can be anything, so I'll just leave it as z. So you could describe it like this, x, x squared z. So again, all we did was a very easy substitution. I just said there's y and there's y. So what we're going to do is take the other version of y and sub it in right there. Where did you get the x squared? Oh, that was our curve that we were on originally, right there. Oh, so I'm describing this cylinder right here. and just talking about different ways to describe it. If you were solving a system, you would say the z uh, variable would be free in this case. If you were talking, this is not a linear system because we are not on a line. So it's not a linear system, but you could say in this system, z is free. That would be thinking in a more linear algebra kind of a way. So let's look at linear surfaces, the easiest type. So linear surfaces, these are all going to be planes. So linear surface is a cylinder, except your curve is a line. So you have a, you're making a cylinder, but your curve is now a straight line. So you're moving a line across another line. I guess uh, you could say a line is a linear surface where you're moving a line across it itself. Kind of lame, but if you move a line across a line and it's parallel to the line itself, you're going to just get a line. But assuming that they're not parallel, you're going to get an entire plane. So generally, a linear surface is going to be a plane. So you're going to move a line across another line. So I was using black for the curve, so we'll stick with that. That's my original curve. So here's the curve I'm going to move across. And then the objects I'm going to move across it are lines. So the shape you would form is a plane. They don't have to be perpendicular. As long as they're not parallel, you will get a plane. And again, these objects go forever both directions. So this is infinitely wide, infinitely tall. So that's linear surface. It's going to have the equation ax plus by plus cz equals d. You can see the normal is abc. And if you're careful, you can, uh, well, you don't have to be that careful. You can pretty easily get points on the plane by picking x and y and uh, deciding what z needs to be. How would we get the normal? Let's think about uh, the beginning information. We have, basically we have two lines. We have one line there in purple and the other lines already drawn in black. Cross product. Cross product. So if you've got two vectors and you need a third, there's a pretty good chance crossing them is how to get the third vector. Not always true, but let's look at what's happening here. What happens if we cross purple and black? I was thinking we, we get prints. Um, <laughs> so we get a vector that's perpendicular or orthogonal to the plane that both of these live on. So we get a vector either pointing directly to us or away from us, depending on the order we crossed. So the trial do use blue for that. I don't know. I'm not an artist here. I guess I'll draw it. It's mostly coming out of the board. Of course, you can't really draw that. So we've got a right angle there a and a right angle there. If we were going to actually have these lines being drawn in real time as 
fast as they would be going according to their scalars. Would the blue line grow exponentially because the area would be growing exponentially? So how is, so is your question basically how does the magnitudes of the original vectors affect the magnitude of the cross product? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. So let's look at that. So if we have u cross v, so how is, you actually know the answer to this. We have a relationship that, we have an equation that matches all these together. So we can use the sine theta relationship. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way to look at it is, let's see. Let's suppose u and v are units. And then I'll just multiply them by scalars and look at how the cross product looks then. So let's suppose magnitude u is uh, 1. Magnitude v is also 1, so that uh, we can look at alpha u cross beta v. So now you may have to uh, break open your algebraic properties of the cross product. So I'm going to flip back a few pages to our cross product, which I think was 12.4. Cross product. So I'm using the in my notes here is the first property of the cross product. This is alpha times u cross beta v. So I can bring a scalar outside the product, and I can also bring the second scalar outside. So we got alpha times beta. And I can bring scalars outside of magnitudes, as long as they're positive, or I can bring them outside with the absolute values. So what this tells you is the cross product is going to get bigger by whatever alpha is multiplied by beta. So for example, if your individual vectors doubled in length, your cross product would quadruple. Um, and if one was, it's basically the product of the scale of each of those two vectors. Okay, but it was not exponential in You could say it's quadratic. It's basically quadratic, uh, meaning if, if they both double, we, our uh, cross product would quadruple. Okay. It would be the square of that. And there's a reason we call these products just like the uh, dot product. The dot product is really similar. If I was looking at dot product in a similar way, obviously geometrically it gives me something completely different. But I could write this as alpha beta u dot v. So the dot product grows in a really similar way. So if I doubled my each individual vector, I'd quadruple my dot product. So that's why we call them products. So, is that a word people still use, an aside? Something that's not terribly relevant? Okay, so I'll label that as an aside. So, we talked about linear surfaces. Uh, half of the last section we looked at was planes, linear surfaces, so that was probably enough discussion on linear surfaces, so we're going to look at quadratic surfaces. Oh, they gave my color, no, they didn't give my colors back. Quadratic surfaces. So I could write out the formula, ax squared plus bx, this is the general form. 
cy squared plus dy plus ez squared plus fz equals g. So a quadratic surface can be described like this. Depending on what you're doing, you may want to complete the square on x's, y's, and or z's. Uh, the types, if you graph these out, so there are ellipsoids, paraboloids, elliptical cones, and hyperboloids. So these come from curves that are ellipses, parabolas, ellipses again, or hyperbolas. So those are the different quadratic uh, curves. And then essentially, you just put the oid at the end. Elliptical cones are a little different. Ellipses, pretty easy to draw. So elliptical cone, all your lines are not parallel. Your lines will go, all go through one certain point and touch the uh, ellipse. So your lines will be lined up like this right here. And I'll do dotted lines in the back. So that would be an elliptical cone right there. So in general, your lines don't have to be parallel. Most of the surfaces we're going to talk about, the lines will be parallel. Yes, yeah, so they will. So technically, a, a cone is actually a double cone, because there'll be another infinite cone at the top. So when we get into the calculus portion, how do we specify one cone? Before? Oh, we'll limit the height of the cone, basically. Okay. Or I could give you an improper integral, or ask you to inf integrate over an infinite area, but then the individual pieces better get very small or else we'd have infinity. So generally, we'll be taking slices. We'll be taking parts of these. We won't take the infinite. Uh, but yeah, don't forget about improper integrals. You can integrate over an infinite either. Um, before, we just integrated over a, the entire real axis, or half of the real axis. So we integrated over an infinitely wide uh, region. You can do the same thing in higher dimensions. You just have a limit that at the very end after you integrate, you would evaluate. So let's write out some of these surfaces. Ellipsoid. So if you have an ellipsoid, you could write it. Uh, this would be centered at the origin. You want to be a little careful when you say the word origin. You have to know what dimension you're in to know if it's 0, 0, or 0, 0, 0. Or if you're doing something crazy in four dimensions, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the word origin is ambiguous until you know what dimension you're in. Is that at origin, or is that just a circle? Yeah, it's an at. Okay. So the ellipsoid looks really similar to an ellipse. The only difference is you get a z component as well. So it looks just like a normal ellipse. Uh, if it's not centered at the origin, you'll have x minus h over a squared plus y minus k over b squared plus z minus uh oh, that's a scary ringtone, man, especially as a professor. <laughs> All right, what's a good letter? H, K, L? I, J, K, we'll go with L. All right, so where is this centered? It's not 
HKL that is right. Should probably just write the word center. Center equals. So it's not good to think about a radius for an ellipsoid because, or an ellipse in general, because depending on what axis you look, you'll get it. You'll be looking at a different radius. So I'm only going to graph the one center at the origin because graphing generally is really tricky in three dimensions. We can sort of get away with it at the origin. So let's uh, do our best ellipsoid graph at the origin. So we are going, when we use the x-axis, we're going to go a in both directions. So that's our, you could think of these numbers as the local axis or the, or the local radius the x-axis radius. When I go across the y-axis, I get to go over b both directions. And now I can draw my uh, xy plane ellipse. So there is an ellipse here. I'm going to switch. I'll do my graphing in blue. So if you want to draw a good ellipse, the way I do it is I draw small tangents right there. So this is how the curve, the tangent of the curve is going to look at these four points. And I'm going to try to match these up nicely here so the tangents match. So you need to make a sharp turn there. So I put my four little tangent marks in right there, and then did my best to get my ellipse going right there. If you do that carefully with a little practice, you too can draw ellipses. All right, we're going to go up on the z-axis now. C is how much we're going up and down. Let's uh, draw it like it's uh, a little bit bigger than A and B. So I'm going up and down whatever amount C is. Now we have two more ellipses to draw. Let's do the easy one, which is the uh, ZY. So the ZY is easy because it's drawn flat on the paper. So we're going to draw our ZY ellipse first. And now your tangents are actually vertical and horizontal. So this is the one that's aligned with, you could say aligned with the camera, or aligned with our perspective here. Now our last ellipse is the xz ellipse. So we're going from a to c to negative a to negative c. So we're linking all the a's and c's together now. So my tangents at my a points are vertical. At my c points are parallel with the x-axis. So that's how I'm drawing these tangents. They're parallel with the other axis. That's about as good as I can draw. I don't like the way the bottom right looks, but I don't have enough skills to make it look much better. So yeah, last circle is going through the A's and C's, and negative A and negative C. No, it's not a circle, but the last ellipse. Oh no. <laughs> Did I have it better before? Yes. All right, let's leave it like that then. 
All right, that's an ellipsoid. You don't have to center them at the origin, but if you don't have a center at the origin, it's much harder to draw. So we're not going to draw one that's not centered at the origin. So we're going to look at a cross section now. So the best way to think of a cross section is if you are uh, slicing up this object with a knife and what actual piece that uh, a knife cuts things in half, but if it actually removed a sliver, what would that sliver look like? So what we're going to do is cut this with a plane and then we're going to look at the intersection of the plane and this object. So a cross section is the intersection of a plane with another object. So our other object will be our quadratic surface. So let's do a cross section where uh, Z, we'll take the original ellipsoid. make the first one easy and z equals zero. So we'll pick a super easy cross section at first. So I want you to describe it. We have a picture of our ellipsoid up top. So describe the plane z equals zero intersecting with this ellipsoid. Now when I say describe it, you could write some words, but I want you to write uh, set builder notation. Yes. No, it's all these. It's this shell right here. It's basically an eggshell, is what it is. Uh, a symmetric eggshell. I think eggs are skinnier on one side and bigger on the other, but it's pretty much an eggshell. So I want you to cut the eggshell with the z equals zero plane and then describe what you get. You can draw a picture of it if you can't describe it in words or in set builder notation, but eventually want to get to a set builder notation description. So do your best to describe that intersection in whatever way you can. So one way to describe it 
is all points x, y, 0, because I want z to be 0. So there's no, there's no choice on z, such that x over a plus y over b squared plus z over c squared equals 0. So it satisfies the original equation. There's a piece of this equation I don't need anymore. So why do I not need that third term? Z's, well, z is already 0, so this would always be 0 right here. So you can omit that last term, and that's your regular ellipse in two dimensions. You do need to specify that z equals 0. So it would be incorrect to just put x, y, z right there. Question. Um, I think maybe I'm thinking, but do you have the uh, graph upside down? Does it have negative a on the top and then a on the bottom? Um, I think I drew the x-axis, the positive one, going out. But, however, it, uh, you could draw your positive x-axis going back, too. Okay. A lot of these are just arbitrary choices. Gotcha. Depends. I mean, if you're more concerned about the bottom of the object, you probably, you'd probably be looking at a completely different angle. You draw it in a very different way. So it just depends on what side you want as the front. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes you're focused on the top, sometimes bottom, sometimes left, sometimes, yeah. There's no such thing as a front or back. It's just whatever you're looking at at the time. So I come at equals zero, not one. Oh, geez. Oh. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> so there's our first. Let's look at uh, z equals 1 half now. Uh, the standard way to write an ellipse out is one of these two ways. You could, if there's, you could do some factoring and get maybe each of those was a multiple of four. So you might be able to factor it one half out, bring it to the other side if you want to. But generally, we like to keep one there. So then A, B, and C are how far you're going on the axes, basically. So I could, I could multiply by A squared, and then the first term would just be X but then it wouldn't be so obvious what the other measurements are. So this is generally the best way to think of an ellipse because you can visualize it the easiest. And again, there's not really a radius. There's sort of three radii going on, depending on what axis you're looking at. All right, same ellipse, cut with a different plane. So do your best to describe this. And your z-coordinate better not be zero this time around. So, is there supposed to be a plus sign after the, on the second line after that? 
Okay. Yep. So drawing this out is not terribly useful because it's kind of hard to see how high up you are on the z-axis. You can try. I did my best effort right here. Hey, look, I'm half up on the z-axis. But you're no longer at negative a and positive a anymore, and negative b and positive b. You're a little bit smaller. So there was the original uh, cutout that we used before would have been a little bit bigger. Man, I wish I was better at drawing something like this. It would be a little bit wider and lower. Oh, geez. <laughs> but you get the point. It's a little bit wider of a belt around the middle of the egg than a belt around part way up on that egg. Anyways. Yeah, I think the problem is the first, the original ellipse is not accurate, so my second one's <laughs> never going to match. All right, that's again proving why drawing these graphs is not terribly useful. So you want some idea of what's going on, but you don't need to accurately graph it. You do need to understand how to write out the coordinates for this uh, object that we're describing. That is important. <coughs> 